So Rabbi Jack asked me tonight to go through like life cycle. Let's go. Can you can you do like when, from when you're born to you die? And is there a theme? Is there a theme? And of course, of course, there's a theme because it's the most important theme. It's called why you're here and what life is about. So if you have that answer already, you can leave. Go ahead. <laughs> and if you don't have that answer, you like a different answer. So we'll try and go for it. Okay. So like it's college football season. It's great. And and. Uh, you have this, you know, this phenomena where you have grown men like holding down major careers and life cycle events and like going to places, but like every Saturday they're still in their heyday college football jersey, like ah, like that's it. They basically never left 19, 20 years old at the fraternity house. And like you're talking about sixty year old guys like went to Michigan and like one dog's named Maze and it was named Blue and like the house and the colors and the garage and where we go. Like, the whole life literally is just back to where you were in college, your heyday. And it's just like a slow demise until you die of like rooting for your team, okay? And that's a, that's a lot of people whose heyday, your prime was like, I, you know, when I was in college, that's your prime, you're young, you're virile, the world's your oyster, like da da da, and then, then you just slowly decay, right? And like at a funeral, you stand up there, and you call a rabbi like me, he's like, he was a great tennis player, you know, and like, oh, he can't play tennis anymore. It's okay. Like, you know, one more, one more, you know, give him one more overhead volley, whatever it is. Like, that can't be it. Okay? It can't be it. And, like, I had a phone call this morning from my father. My father said, certain friend, you know, the uncle that's not really your blood uncle, but your parents' friend, you have to call uncle. So he said, like, something happened to him, whatever. And he's in his 70s and something like that. Like, it's so sad. It's like, his life is over. That's it. Like, he's nothing. He's just rotting in his bed. And my father, and I'm like, yeah, it's really sad. It's really sad. And, the guy was a lawyer his whole life and played golf. That's what he did. He just, he literally, when he wasn't in the office, he was playing golf. And it's kind of like, but that's like, he can't even play golf anymore. I'm like, that can't be what it's all about. It can't be like, oh no, I can't play golf anymore and I'm dead now. Like, it's got to be, right? We don't just try and remember our youth for the rest of our lives until we die. It's got to be something we're going for. We don't peak as Jews when we're 20, we peak when we're 90. Okay, we got to peak someplace all the way at the end. So what's that vision? Okay? So here's the through line. It's very simple. You are a body. It's a body. A body is a physical entity with physiology, biology, chemistry. It's physical. And it draws down. It is drawing down here in this world. And it is the quintessential taker. It needs. It eats. It feeds. Argh! That's what this body is in all the physical world itself. There's a body down here and there's a soul that's up there. And the soul is something which is a biopsy of God himself. And it is drawn to the spiritual world. It is the ultimate source of giving. It is these things are are, are pitched at polar opposites. They're, they're total opposites of creation and extremes, and they are somehow miraculously fused together. And you have a thing which is the essence, the essential notion of what it means to take the body, the physicality, and you have the thing which represents the ultimate source of giving, of giving. That's the soul. And this thing is going to go through life and go from the ultimate taker to the ultimate giver. And that's going to be a theme of life. That's going to be a theme of life. We are, uh, it's in, in, in Latin, it's called imitatio deo, to imitate God. That's the goal of life, okay? It's not like carpe diem, seize a day, or like YOLO, you only live once. You're actually trying to be created in God's image. What is God's image? It's not beard and whatever it is. It's just, that's, a, that's not our imagery of God, right? There's something called God's image, selim elokim, which really means the shadow of God. Can we be the shadow? What's your shadow? Everything you do, it does. Everything you do, it does. Can we live in the, in the shadow? Can we become the shadow of God? What's the shadow of God? God is the ultimate source of giving. We have to spend our entire lives breaking through the body, elevating the body, and ultimately becoming the greatest giver we can be. And that's most like the Almighty, most like our Creator, most like our source. So let's go through. You with me? So let's go through. You see, it's all through life. We're born. What does it mean, birth? You have this glob of cells, of nothingness, and like it's cute for sure. And thank God it's cute because when you have kids, they keep you up all night. So you want to make sure that because at the end of the day, you have something four days ago. Okay, it's really cute. Right? <laughs> Pooping all over you, and like urinating upwards in your eye. You're like, okay, it's cute, right? It's just a thing like just taking it as an id monster. There's a soul in there. But this, we have a soul, it's a five-level soul, that's not for now. It's a five-level complicated soul, but it's slowly getting mushed into this body. And when we come through that birth canal, boom, it gets locked into the body where it's like locked in. It's that Lego piece, it's locked down in there. Not the whole soul, not all five levels, and not even the most important level where your brain is, where you think, 
where you really rationalize and you are exercising the part of you that's most active now in your life and most like God down here, it's not even there. You have the life force itself, the bottom one, and maybe like the passions and the emotions that can part of them, but it's locked in, comes through the birth canal, the baby's born, boom. There's a body and it's an id monster. A baby is id. Ah, eating, nothing, ah, all taking, 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 sucking, eating, even when it wants, you, 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 a kid, a two-year-old finds it in the ground, puts it in his mouth first. It's just all taking and consuming. That's all the baby is, okay? What you first thing you do with a baby, you give it a name. What is a name? The word name in Hebrew is Shem. The word Shem is the same word as Sham, there. That's the essence. There's a soul in this body. It's rooted in, miraculously fused to the body, and now you give that soul its unique form by a name. Our sages teach us that naming the child is the last vestige of prophecy. You're like literally opening up the heavens and tapping into the essence of this soul, this source of giving, what's unique about how you're going to give in the world, what's unique about what you're going to give to the world, is in the name, that's the DNA of this soul in the child, and it gets a name. Now, if something happens to a boy that's different to a girl at this stage, a boy, a woman's soul and body are locked into place, so all that soul needs now is identifying DNA features of its giving form, and that's the name that comes right from the heavens. And the man is a little bit of a lower, less perfect, perfected creation, and that creation, the body has to undergo also a formulation to give it its perfect, locked-in spiritual body form. Quite interestingly, the place of that repair that is done to the male body is at the place where it is the most essential thing which reflects taking, pleasure, lust, I want, give it to me. That's what it is. And every phallic symbol in the world represents that, including all the convertible cars that the guys drive, right? And what you're turning that thing into by this thing called circumcision is actually crowning it in the glory of being the greatest giver that we can have in our whole arsenal, okay? Ultimately, it gives life. And it gives connection at the highest point between husband and wife, this connection. And ultimately at the highest point of life. The thing which the rest of the world out there is like the, for taking and taking and taking and, and the horrible things are really there to be the ultimate source of giving, the ultimate source of giving life. Okay? Then we move on to the next stage is childhood. Childhood, what's this little id monster growing up from 2 to whatever, 12 or 13? It's just taking and it's receiving and, 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 and it's, it's got no obligations and... All we do with a child is get it to sense what it, that it feels good to be good. That's the way the child teaches to share and do good. Do you want a child to feel good to be good? Because being good is what we're going for, the giving, to be good, to be a giver. So you're going to train this child that what it feels good to be good. That's what you do with a child. You protect it, of course, and all the other things. But the amazing thing about that age, there's something called chinuch. In Hebrew, that's the word for education, chinuch except it's a terrible definition, a terrible translation. The word chinuch doesn't mean education, it means something else. Chanukat abayet, when you have a house and you dedicate the house, the word for education is not education in Hebrew, it's dedication. You are raising a child so that it's instinct. It becomes dedicated to the cause of being good, of goodness in the world. That's what you're doing to that stage. Then comes Bar Bat Mitzvah. Bar Bat Mitzvah is an amazing thing. You, I, it's kind of like, oh, you're so happy. The lady of the sisterhood gives me the kiddish cup. And, oh, look at you. I knew you were on the You're such a man. You become a man. I'm not a man. I'm a 13 year old fisher. This mother thing is a man. I'm, a, I'm this big. Right? It's crazy that we think that you become a man. You're a woman. You're not. You're 12 as a girl, and you're 13 as a boy. You're not a man, and you're not a woman. You're nowhere near it. So, what are you? What is it then? Just give me an 18 year old debut to a 16 year old debut cup. It's more like a woman than to the 12 year old girl. And the answer is what happens at 12 or 13 is an intellectual rite of passage. That means your soul has locked down into the body hard enough and fast enough where the thing called das, your mind begins to work. You can, you don't know, understand things, but you can decipher between right and wrong. And you can choose to do the right and do the good. You don't understand it, you don't comprehend it, you're still relying on your parents for the real information, but you have the ability to make the differential to differentiate between right and wrong, to be held responsible for that choice and those actions. It's an intellectual rite of passage. The ability, that soul essence, is more expressed in a higher level in something called Das. And then we get to the worst part, teenage wasteland. You, 
my, my who reference, okay? Teenage dumb, I think I have four teenagers right now and your insurance car insurance rates are like, you can't believe what they charge you, okay? So this whole area of teenagers is an amazing thing. Teenagers are the most, it's the most awkward phase and you have to pretend to really respect the teenagers' authority and how they go. And it's just, you're just faking it the whole time. They're like, I need my space, Dad. I don't like oh, yeah, sure. I have to make my own decisions. Oh, yeah, you make your own decisions. Right. My wife and I are like, yeah, right, okay. You just got to fake it, right? You have this thing called teenage. And really, in the real idea is this is the age where you're really learning Torah. You're not just being told, put on your, give tzedakah, give charity, like a little, you're now starting to learn and starting to understand. The knowledge of just being able to do the right thing versus the wrong thing now has to start to come with understanding. But you are totally self-obsessed. In fact, the death penalty in Judaism is, is at a 20-year-old. Why? Because in order to be obligated in capital punishment in Jewish law, a person has to understand that they're really rebelling against God. And we basically understand that someone who's before their 20, in their teens, cannot truly understand what it means that something exists outside of them. You're totally self-absorbed. You can know the word God, you can hear the concept of God, but you cannot comprehend it. The understanding that there's something outside of you is totally 100% foreign, even if you say the words. So they can't be held responsible because they can never really rebel against God because they really don't have an understanding of something outside because it's all inwardly focused. So we train them to do mitzvot, to do good deeds. Right? They should learn how to do good deeds, they learn how to give, but they're just do-goers. Uh, do-gooders. They're just do-gooders. Okay? They're not deeply good. That soul isn't activated when it's deeply good. They're just learning how to do good in a very topical, superficial way. But we teach them and they learn Torah, they learn the mitzvot, they learn God's wisdom, but they're learning it outside of them. It's not incorporated because they are only themselves and nothing outside can get in. That's teenage them. Then we get to the next phase, very critical for all of you. It's called dating and, I'm going to say marriage, because marriage is after dating and a wedding, let's say. That stage, we're now, let's talk about the age of 20, okay, that's when we have a little tradition back there in the old days of 20 years old. 20, a person gets an understanding of something outside of themselves. The brain's matured enough, a person's consciousness is matured, that they can really comprehend there's something outside of themselves, so then you can begin to get married. Because you cannot get married when all you're looking at is yourself. And that person is only just a full-time fill-in-the-blank, okay? That's not what it's about. It's about really genuinely accepting upon yourself, even though you know nothing about marriage, accepting upon yourself the obligation to completely give to someone else. You have to know that there's somebody else out there, and that's a real other person. A real, live other person. Before 20, you can't understand it. After 20, you can't. You make a decision for the rest of your life without knowing anything about marriage. Why? Because at that point in time, you can really be asked to know yourself. Judaism is the secret to a great marriage when you get married. It's not that you know everything about the other person, what their politics are, what books they like, what their favorite colors, what their dogs they what their girls. That's nothing's going to help you in marriage if you know any of that. The only thing that's going to help you in marriage when you get married is how well you know yourself. Okay? It's very deep. Then comes the process of marriage. The process of marriage is about nothing other than giving. Giving superficially, you could do good or is nothing. You could just give charity. It's good, it's nice, it's good. You gave charity that, you did that, that, that. But when you're married, you have to give to a person a very deep giving. A type of giving to fulfill emotional needs. Deep needs that we have. Deep physical needs. Deep emotional needs. You have to give in such a way that where nobody else can fulfill those needs. It's a giving that is critical. It's life and death of the other person. So you're not giving what you want. I don't buy my wife tickets to the, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the playoffs. She doesn't, she's not interested in that. I have, to, I have to give to my wife what she needs and what she wants and what her lack is and I have to fill it and vice versa. It's the process of becoming completely and utterly selfless. We call God which means that God's goodness is that he gives goodness and Jewish philosophy, you're not even really existing, you don't even count until you're married because that's the first place where the curtain opens and you're on stage. You actually really can give in the deepest, most profound way. That's where real giving begins. That's when you're really alive, and that's when you're really giving. And that's when marriage begins. The word you know for love is ahava, right? Ahava means love. So if you deconstruct that word, that word means ahava. What is love? I love you, I love you, I love you. means nothing out there. Kim Kardashian probably falls in love every afternoon. I don't know. I don't know who she is. I couldn't recognize her. Whatever. Right? Falling in love, that's not love. The word ahava, you've heard this before, many of you, but you have to hear it again. The word ahava, the root of that word is to give. Have. 
when you're in synagogue, they say, Havu, no, 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 Havu, Havu. You listen to that word, Havu, it means to give. That's the root of the word, Ahava, is to give. You will only really have love as a result of the degree, the quality, the quantity of how you give. In fact, if you know anything about Hebrew grammar, the Aleph in front, Ahava, the Aleph in Hebrew grammar says, I will. So the word love means I will give. I don't take it, I love it, I love fish, I, I eat it, I love this, I love that, I love a car, I love it, no. It's loving is a totally selfless giving. You have to identify that with someone else, identify that person's needs, and commit yourself to no longer even recognizing your own needs in lieu of someone else's. And hopefully your spouse does the same. That's where marriage is. Moves to the next stage, children. You think that's called love. The greatest giving, unconditional giving, is to your children. By the way, the reason why God set up the world that you need to get married is so that we can learn how to relate to God. Right? I'm also supposed to connect to God in a deeply intimate way. That's what he wants from us. It's all a metaphor for Marriage is all a metaphor for our connection to God. We need to get married and get outside of ourselves and really give and connect to someone else. It's not a quid pro quo, like I need something you have my back scratch here, your back scratch here, we're all good to go. No, the reason why God made me lacking and my wife lacking, and we have needs, all of us have needs, because that's the glue that brings us together. But the goal is the oneness. The goal is you don't know where you stop and the other person begins. Physically, spiritually, and emotionally. You don't know where you stop and the other person begins. You become one. That's an incredible gift. But children is even greater. It's even greater. You know, if you ask anybody for a great marriage, would you give your life to your spouse? They'll say yes. But they'll think about it for a half second. Right? And you, you're like, that's so stupid to think about. But you ask me, you give your life to your kid, you don't even think about it. It's nothing. There's a level of giving, giving that's even greater than that. And if marriage is teaching you how to connect to God, having children is teaching you how to be like God. How to give you ask for nothing in return. Especially when your teenager goes, you're such an idiot, Dad. You don't understand me. You don't know what you're you kidding? It's insane. It's so crazy. It's so crazy what I put into you. Like wiping your tush for, for four years, whatever, like like everything that big like oh, Tina, you dad, look at my room. It's crazy, but you but you gotta take it because you give everything to this child. The kid doesn't even understand nothing. You get nothing in return. <laughs> really, nothing in return. But you give so much, and that's where all the love is because you become truly a fountain of giving. Then you're going through life with the rest of you're out there in the world, you're doing. My friend called me when he made his kid's bar mitzvah. My really good friend, and he said, like he called me, I said, What's the what's the biggest thing that you 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 Realized, what's your aha moment? He says, I actually realized I'm finally alive. He says, like, I'm raising a child, I have a business, I'm giving charity to the community, I'm looking after those people, I'm doing this, I'm trying to be, leave a legacy. He's like, I wasn't alive until now, like, I, I'm awake. In fact, the word for a city is ear, which means where you're awake, where you're woke. That whole stuff they got from us, I'm woke now. Thank you very much. Okay? They got that from us. You're awake, that means you're alive. You're spending your life and you're giving and you're doing and you're broadening those concentric circles. But it starts here. You fill a pitcher up and it overflows everywhere. You fill the pitcher up with your spouse and you give in the deepest, deepest, most, most pristine and most consequential way and it overflows to the children, overflows everywhere, overflows to you. The bigger you are, the more you and your spouse can fill yourselves up with Torah and with goodness and the more overflows, the bigger impact and legacy you're going to have in life. And then you get old. The word for old in Hebrew is zakein. Which stands for Zen Kona Chachma. That means this one has wisdom. Okay? When you're old, it doesn't mean, oh, darn, they can't yacht anymore, they can't play golf, or what they, you know, that's not it. A person, a Jew, is supposed to get to a place where they are venerated, where they have wisdom and experience. When an old person walks in the room, you have to stand up for them. It's a serious business. This person has life in front of them, all of life with a perspective and a 360 view that you could never have. This person has been giving their whole life. Zekona Chachma. By the way, I walked, I'm sorry, I walked out of Mr. Broadway and there were 30, 40 little ladies this big with their, with their shakles and little wings and they're dressed up like they're going to the Broadway show and they're all like 89 years old, zipper frames and everything, walking down Broadway in 37, okay? It was the cutest thing you've ever seen with their bed. They literally probably spent all morning getting dressed up with the lipstick and everything. And there was a tall lady, I had my daughter go up there and she said, oh, they're from an old age home in Borough Park, all women just ladies. And they're literally 30 to 40, 90 year old women. You can imagine, they're all Hasidic ladies, you can imagine they each have hundreds of children and great-great-grandchildren, hundreds. There are thousands of descendants coming from these women, 
They probably all had numbers on their arms when they see them they think through. To walk by them because you're late for your latte and your Pilates class or whatever it is, and like a bunch of old ladies. Are you crazy? These people have so much. They live their whole there's so much, they're full of chesed and goodness and kindness and giving. They have to know how to see them. And then we die. And when we die, what happens is that taker that our body has was when it was a little kid, and it just became a vessel of giving and goodness through life, that body goes away. And what you're left with is the goodness that you created yourself to be. The giver that you created yourself to be. And God's the ultimate giver. And you become the giver without any to take. And you connect to God in the heavenly realms because you are really like God. God is the ultimate giver, unconditional giver, unconditional lover. And you spend your whole life becoming that unconditional giver, unconditional lover. And that's the goal. You peak when you, the day before you die. And you're going, well, if you really want to know, we can talk about reincarnation. So we believe in that stuff. But I want you to know, I wasn't raised religious. My first vision of a religious Jewish community was I walked into a place called the Kolo, and there was an old rabbi, long, old, gray beard, and pious, and sitting there, and he was sitting around a table just like this, and like 13 year old Bar Mitzvahs. He was sitting with his arms around him, he was playing with one kid's ear on that side. You would think, like, yeah, you know, the guy should be in prison. Like, like this guy's a Holocaust survivor, okay? It's like his grandkid. Every little Jewish kid's his grandkid. And he was like playing with this one's ear and rubbing that one in the back, and he was sitting around, and they were talking about the story of Cain and Abel. Was teaching these 12, 13 year old boys who were just getting their minds, teaching them about jealousy, expectations, and disappointment. And it was the most gorgeous thing I ever seen because I grew up in Florida. When you went into a room, there was an old person and you left because it meant you had an early bird shoot or something or some synagogue. Like you run away from old people in the world out there, you just not you run away from them. And I went into a world where they're venerated and the wisdom and the goodness and the giver that they become is the greatest thing that we can strive to be. Okay, it's a life cycle of what it means to be a giver, not a taker. And the ultimate, at the end of your life, the greatest giving you do is allowing other people to give back to you. That's why your body grows old and you need your children and your community to look after you. And they get such pleasure if you become the right person that them giving to you is the greatest gift you give them. Think about that. That's really deep. Thank you for listening. Take questions. Got a lot, Reverend Lynn.